Hi there, my name is Philippe. I do this unique thing in JetBrains. Up until recently, I was the only person doing this. I mean, drawing typefaces. And uh, Stanislav joined me in this glorious endeavor a few months. He's been developing JetBrains Mono specifically, but we'll talk about it a bit later. So, today I want to talk about two things. One is hopefully a well-known project, JetBrains Mono, a typeface for IDE, a typeface specifically to write code. And the second thing is something that I've been doing for the last six months or so, that is something more global, a typeface, JetBrains Sons. But let us start from the beginning and I'll tell you about JetBrains Mono and uh, perhaps show off with a few figures that we've been able to achieve since the release, which happened on January 15th this year, 2020. So it's been nine months. Let's see what we've been able to do with it. Let's see the figures. The first figure is the number of people who install the typeface as default typeface for programming, writing a code in their IDE. So, and I try to pick actually the least optimistic figures in the most cases, depending on the sampling of the users, it fluctuates from 94% to 88%, as you might see here. I mean, we dominate as the preferable typeface to write code. Next figure is a number of downloads from our official landing page. This is 240,000. Unfortunately, we can only track official downloads from the landing with Google Analytics. We cannot see how many people actually downloaded typeface from GitHub, from our repo, or through other sources such as Brew or whichever. A few other things that we've been able to do in the last nine months. In the first version of JetBrains Mono, there were 639 symbols. Seems to be quite a lot. But in the version 2.200, which we have recently released, quite recently, there are 1,137 symbols, and that figure is growing thanks to my friend and colleague Stas, who joined me. In addition, one of the major primary demands that we had after the first release of JetBrains Mono was the request to make thinner styles. They are really in demand to make the typeface look good on dark background. I mean, lots of developers prefer to write code on dark background. That's why it's a very important feature request. So, we added a few styles. In addition to light, we added super light and super, super light. Also, we added to this uh, light styles, of course, the corresponding italics. So, seven straight styles and seven italics overall. And a major feature in the version 2.200 2.200, whatever, is of course th that we, the fact that we added Greek alphabet and Stas helped a lot particularly with that. The release was not as smooth as we expected. We made a couple of letters not as perfectly as we wanted to, but the community on GitHub helps us all the time, hints about the request. They're very keen on that. So in the upcoming releases, I think we'll fix it. We'll fix it all. And of course, a few releases ago, JetBrains Mono got this variable function so that you don't need to, to actually choose the style. You have just a slider from 100 to 900 and you can easily set up the style, the thickness, the lightness that you would prefer. Unfortunately, our IDE does not support that, so this feature only works if you want to make some kind of fancy design or you're writing a code within the browser, because um, 
Browsers, of course, support CSS and uh, variable function supports CSS. And that's another mountain top that we still need to conquer while improving our IDE. We've been talking about what we have already done. Now let's look into the future and I'll tell you about what we would really love to do, how we want to improve JetBrains Mono. First thing is style sets. Why do we need style sets? JetBrains Mono generally is always, was always meant as a typeface to write code. And that is why certain design needs were not that much taken into consideration. They were on the sidelines. I mean, JetBrains Mono is a typeface that should perform well within IDE and in certain text massives. But we had to pay for that with certain fanciness, certain details. Therefore, I really don't want to stop on this good IDE performance for code. That's why we add alternatives to certain symbols so that we would have the balance proportion of harmony between black and the white so that the text works better in headings, for example. And you can see on this slide alternative shapes for R letter, for example. So when we need to solve some design task, this shape works better because it creates the uh, regular rhythm for the word. But when we read a huge massive of text, this type of writing is overloaded with details and it might be distracting. Also, we have alternatives for L, K, E and all the rest that we'd figure out along the way. Another thing that has been improving alongside the bug fixes and alternatives is, of course, the addition of different signs. We add math signs, we add certain operators, different elements of box drawing and different sorts of geometries and shapes. So all of those things are used in code, believe it or not. So, great, we've talked about JetBrains Mono. We have taken a look at what happened to it in the last nine months. We shared our plans for the future. Now, let us speak about JetBrains Sons. Yes, I've said in the beginning that this is a sort of typeface that would be used on a more global scale and it is supposed to solve broader set of problems, issues, it should work as part of our branding, part of visual communication of JetBrains, not just as a workhorse to write code. And the first question that you might get, why do you need a new typeface for branding? Because, I mean, we already have a typeface for branding, why, why would you change anything? It's been working fine. And having answered that question, we'll be able to talk about how we can make this new thing. So, let me answer those questions. And let us first figure out why we need a new typeface at all. As strange and as obvious as it sounds, the main reason is money. We pay royalties and fees for every view of our landing page or anywhere else online if we use our typeface, our current uh, brand typeface, Gotham. Because that's just the reality of um, font and typeface licensing. I mean, we license that typeface, Gotham, for our branding, and if we use our own, we can save a lot of money. In addition, if we develop a typeface on our own, we can define how to change it, how to develop it, when to halt and freeze its condition. I mean, we can develop and change it up till the point when we are happy and we feel like we need it. Unfortunately, with a ready-made typeface that we pay for, we have no control whatsoever. I mean, it will be probably very expensive to modify it and change it. That will be even more complex and more expensive licensing and negotiations. What's more, we can make our typeface open source, helping the community. 
and we can give the community some fine and nice and awesome typeface. Consequently, we'll increase brand awareness, increase the power of the brand and just um, drive attention to JetBrains, not to mention doing something good for, for the world. We have been talking about why we need our own, our very own typeface. Now, when we understand why, let us try to figure out how, how we would understand the, the looks of this typeface. First things first, we need to get the feeling of the global message of the brand. Of course, that is an abstract, very metaphysical thing. I will not dig too deep into that, but we need to have this logical chain of thought. Let's just stop at saying that there is a brand message, mythical, but the typeface should be part of the brain, brand message. Secondly, we understand that there is a context of how that typeface will be used. And there are different contexts for that. The context of our products, the context of current existing branding. And that context is internal and there is more global context of JetBrains as a company in the IT market amongst other big companies. And we need to take those factors into consideration as well when we try to understand what sort of typeface we need to develop for our company. Point three is um, the character of the typeface. Again, this is very metaphysical, but strictly connected to this brand message that we try to convey. So the character defines the tone of the message. The character of the typeface defines the tone of the message. And there are several factors that make an influence on the character. And primarily those are typeface archetypes. So we have this pyramid. Let us unwind it and talk about it in more detail. Let us start with the archetypes, font archetypes, typeface archetypes. What is that? This is a set of certain qualities and certain logics. Relying on those logics, we can get the drawing of the typeface. And we can actually highlight four major archetypes. And by the way, a side note here, we're talking specifically about sans-serif typefaces, non-decorative typefaces, meaning these are typefaces which are pretty much austere and um, they don't have some protruding, literally protruding uh, bombastic elements. And here we can divide the sans-serif fonts into four major archetypes. First, geometric. Geometric archetype. On this slide, you may see the examples of different geometric typefaces. And if you are aware about design, more or less, or you have seen maybe the visual style of NASA, the former visual style, you might be aware, you might know the Futura typeface made by Paul Renner. It's hard to overestimate the influence of this typeface on typographics in general. That is a very significant typeface, Futura a typeface and one of the first attempts to contemplate the shapes of letters from a mathematical standpoint. This typeface looks as though it has been written with the, the ruler and mathematical compass, which is not entirely correct, actually, because when you create a typeface, you still need to make certain optical compensations. It is some very fine tuning that actually makes this called mathematical shape quite adaptive to human brain's perception and eye. There's certain magic and mystery into this job of typeface designer, font designer. And in its proportions, Futura relies still on classical antiquas, meaning serif fonts. And in its proportions, in its broad O letter, and in other letter proportions, we can actually read this reference to serifs. But still, this typeface is very, very geometrical. 
Another example is DIN typeface. Probably also you've seen it. You should be aware of it. I tried to actually pick the most recognizable examples. And for us, DIN is another, another significant typeface in this entire story of creating our own font, because it was, in a way, the archetype, the inspiration for JetBrains Mono. I mean, this idea with vertical platforms on the ovals. It looks very logical and natural in mono typefaces, but that's just a single archetype, the so-called geometric archetype. Let's continue. The next archetype is humanistic archetype, humanistic grotesque, and uh, the significant example here is Jill Sons and Pity Sons. It's mainly no in Russia, by the way. That is a free typeface created by Partype, and Jill Sons is a legendary typeface that's widely known, and if you have not heard its name, you have definitely seen it. What unites these typefaces and this family of typefaces? The feeling of dynamics and movement. Look at the shapes of letters. The signs are open, strongly open, they are very dynamic, and we can actually feel this movement of the quill, the tool that was drawing that shapes. I mean, there is no feeling of math here whatsoever, no mathematical compass, we feel the presence of human being who designed and drawn these letters. Every letter is seeking forwards, vibrating, playing juvenantly. I mean, let's continue. Another archetype, the old-style grotesques. They can be similar to geometry, but unlike a geometric archetype, these typefaces have the contrast of the stroke. I mean, we see that horizontal strokes are visually visually noticeably thinner than the vertical strokes. And as a result, we have this sort of softness and maybe even clumsiness of the shape that evokes the association with the beginning of the 20th century, industrial revolution, so we feel certain uh, memory of warmth of the olden days. And the last archetype that we highlight is the so-called neutral grotesques, the typefaces that are not trying to go through this um, ideological contemplation or contemplation via certain tool, they're just trying to be a typeface. They're trying to remove some sort of visual message from the actual message that's written with this typeface. So, here we're talking about the neutral typeface that is equally good for any type of text. But here you need to understand that when typeface has strong visual character and text is written with that typeface, we have the context of shape and actual content of the text written. And of course, the visuality of the typeface can make a very strong impression on the reader. Because the reader, of course, reads that visual message. So, neutral grotesques is an attempt to remove shape from the message, so that the reader would be completely immersed into the actual content of the written message instead of the visuality of it. I mean, the examples here are San Francisco and Roboto. You've seen them. San Francisco is a default iOS typeface. So, we've defined the major archetypes of typefaces. Why is that important? Every single archetype has a certain message within, certain feeling or emotion. Now, let us try to highlight roughly this sort of character for every archetype. In a case of geometry, that will mostly be the feeling of rationality, certain austerity, and the feeling of this math, uh, the fact that it's calculated. It's visible in every symbol. This is the logic of the typeface, its DNA. In a humanistic typefaces, you would feel this dynamic uh, sense, human warmth and certain charm because in these typefaces we see a human touch, a touch of a human hand, certain 
human error or vibration, which is sort of pleasurable. We recognize ourselves in these typefaces, and that is, of course, empathic. In the old style grotesques, we feel certain warmth, slight nostalgia, because these um, typefaces, in terms of shape, are quite stylized. And the fourth group of typefaces presumes that we do not feel anything when we look at them. We are mostly concentrated on the message, not on the shape when we see these typefaces. All right, we have taken a look at the archetypes. We have understood the characters of archetypes. Now, let us try to look at a broader picture. Let's look at how different big companies actually apply these archetypes and how the companies reflected in those archetypes. First example, Yandex service provider, Yandex with their source, Yandex Sons. And you can see here right away that the archetype for this typeface was humanistic archetype. And that is very logical for a company like Yandex, because the first letter in the title of the company, Ya, which means I or me in Russian, and that's very humane, that is even egoistic. So that's certain flirting with this humanistic archetype, which is quite obvious and correct. Next, let's look at Google. Google is more global and more, let's put it that way, it's more cold company. And Google's corporate typeface, Product Sons, is very geometric by nature. It's more about math, it's more about computing, it's more calculating but still quite neutral, it's quite neutral. Let's continue. Now, IBM, their typeface is sort of calm, austere, technological, but you can get a strong feeling to this uh, reference of historic old-style shapes. And here you can easily understand why, because IBM is an old company with history and they want to retain that association, they want to deliver that association via any communication that we have with IBM. Okay, San Francisco from Apple. Here you can have a clear reference to modernism alienation of any sort of message, visual message, additional visual message. Again, we see here the austerity and elegance of, uh, of modernism. And this sort of style is actually conveyed in Apple products. So here we can see that the typeface plays a very important part of visual communication of the company to deliver the brand message of the company to us, to consumers, to users. So, we have taken a look at the context of how those archetypes are being used. We looked at the cases of different large companies. Now, let us put it all together and put them into some order. First thing that we're going to do is actually we'll select the archetype and character for us, for JetBrains Sons. Here's some sort of visualization where we have distributed the typefaces of the companies uh, that we've been talking about. And please take a look that here geometry and humanity on the same axis. We can see here that Yandex is very close to the peak of humanity. We see that Google is very close to the peak of geometry and IBM is closer to the peak of old-style shapes. And in the center, we can see Apple, which is as neutral as possible. So where can we discover JetBrains in this frame of reference? I believe that this is our point. We are not as cold and as big as Google, but still it's very important to understand that technological context is essential for us. 
I mean, whichever visual communication we convey, we should always try to deliver this feeling of technology. This is very important in making a decision of uh, the visual style of JetBrains Sons the typeface for JetBrains. So, based on this chart, we can realize that geometric archetype should be the foundation for our typeface. It will not be as radical as with Google. It will be more adapted, more skewed towards neutrality. However, we should still retain this feeling of technology that is coming from ge uh, geometric archetype. Point two, another thing that we need to understand is the context of our products. I mean, we have defined that we have the archetype, how can we make this typeface our very own? We have our products, and every time we write the title of the product, it can be improved from the standpoint of typeface. I mean, the typeface contains certain contextual ligatures, those ligatures allow us to write the name of the product in the most visually appealing way. For IntelliJ, that is a beautiful ligature with I and J. For Kotlin, for example, that is the square shape above I that looks much more logical, actually, when we write this word. For space, it's uh, the enhancement of visual rhyming with A, its construction rhymes with other symbols much better. So we can use the sort of approach for every product of ours. This is actually very important. And another thing that you should understand, all of these ligatures work in any text written with this typeface. It's not just specific fine lettering selected by a designer. No, this thing works for every text, any text that you write with this typeface. Another important contextual point, which we should bear in mind. I mean, we already have branding, we have tons of layouts which have been made with other typeface in mind, and the new typeface should not reject or break that entirely, because that's tremendous heritage. And we can see that here that the proportion of heights, black and white, the texture, the saturation of the line, roughly speaking, JetBrains, JetBrains Sansa above and Gotham below, they are pretty similar, so that we don't break all of the layouts when we change uh, the typeface and swap it for JetBrains Suns. I mean, in a perfect world, we would like to have a typeface which would perfectly fit into all of our layouts in the blink of an eye, but we can only sort of patch things up here in certain points. Which other criteria or metrics we can use to compare JetBrains Suns and Gotham? how it comes together. Of course, the height of the line and vertical proportions partially. Here you can see that they're very similar. That has been done intentionally so that we don't break all of our existing layouts uh, and our website layout if we want to just quickly swap one typeface for another. This is how, for example, one of the pages of our website would look uh, with the new typeface. This, this is just a screenshot from browser where I tinkered with CSS a little bit. JetBrains Suns should have seven styles, six standard styles from extra light to extra bold and super, super duper bold for some posters or some large prints or display sets. I mean, we don't want this typeface to limit designers in any way, but instead we would like this typeface to kind of push designers to some ingenious, brilliant, inventful, radical solutions. And of course, JetBrains Sun supports variable styles, so a designer can do some very fine tuning of the thickness according to the preference. So we've been talking about how JetBrains Suns looks today. Let's kind of uh, sum it up. 
and put it together into clear description. Do remember that chart that I've shown you. Let's go back to it. The character of the typeface. By all means, this is geometric archetype that we're talking about, this feeling of technology that's concealed in this archetype. It matters for us. The second thing that we understood along the way is the context of the use of the typeface. We're a tech company, we're about technology. And that again is a reference to geometry. We have uh, talked about the context of our products and we looked at the context of current, current branding. So we designed a typeface bearing all of that in mind. And all these things, all of this leads us to the brand message that the typeface should convey somehow. We do realize that our visual communication and branding can solve many tasks. So the typeface should not interfere with uh, some vivid graphics or illustrations that we're using. I mean, the typeface should be neutral enough, but still retain this feeling of technology. And this feeling of technology should still be a supportive element in any visual communication where this typeface is used. But this is sort of a final images, final ideas, final feelings about the typeface. Of course, we've broken many bones and made many mistakes when we've been designing the, the typeface. And let's take a look together at those failed attempts, failed versions that we had to reject. The major problem that we had was that um, we could not get this grasp uh, right away, get this grasp of how geometric and technological should the typeface be. I mean, these are the first prototypes. A variable style works already. It seems to look cool, fine, but unfortunately, as soon as you try to use this typeface, this thick, saturated, dense, super geometrical and technological concept in the real text, you realize that it's interfering with graphics, drawing too much attention to itself. And yes, on this slide you can see that this extension of the concept that we've used for JetBrain's motto with the platforms, I mean, we try to kind of move it even forwards, creating not only vertical but also horizontal stands and um, for different sorts of display sets or headings, it might work well, but if we speak about some large chunks of text, it does not really work. If some designers or non-designers want to make something more expressive, please do come, I'll share the raw materials with you will try to do something with this concept and keep it alive. Now JetBrain's Sons is in the state of closed alpha. I strictly control the application of the typeface and the leaks of the typeface. As soon as uh, we fix quite a few bugs and errors, as soon as we do a proper test drive of the typeface, we launch the open beta and every single one of you will be able to play with what we've done. What else will be happening to JetBrain Sons in addition to the major concept that we have designed? We also want to add lots of alternative symbols because this sort of typeface should be able to solve a wide range of design tasks. So the typeface should be flexible. So Variable style is a step towards that um, flexibility and, of course, alternative symbols make the typeface more flexible, so it's applicable for a broader range of tasks. Also, we would like to make also the style for text, better style for text. Now, this uh, typeface works very well for headings, but I'd say it's it works a bit worse 
as a UI typeface, for example, or uh, as a typeface for large chunks of text. So we want to polish it up and get the text version. And it's clear what to do there. I mean, we would need to fine tune the proportions. We're making them a little bit more equal in width, but this is something that we will be doing in the future. So I'm pretty much done. Hope you enjoyed uh, my presentation, my talk about typefaces. If you have some sort of feedback or you want to ask some questions, you can always write me on Slack or simply email me. Bye-bye.